Expedition 44 here with Matt and Ryan, and we are in a we've been in a long series on the church over a year now, and that has kind of pulled us into all kinds of other conversations. But today we're taking a little bit of a I say a little bit because we're stepping away to do an interview with one of our favorites, authors, speakers, but it very much relates to the church today. So in some ways we're really not taking a break from the church. We're just talking about it from a different avenue. So Matt, would you like to introduce our guest today? Yeah, I'm super excited to have Steve Gregg on. Steve is a teacher, author. I've got a bunch of his books here right in front of me. Um, Revelation, it's a four pair four view parallel commentary. Um, we've He's got a book on all you want to know about hell. And then his most recent works are on, um, it's called the Empire of the Risen Sun. It's a two-part thing on the kingdom of God. And um, if you don't know Steve Gregg, you need to check him out. He has a ministry called The Narrow Path. Um, he's got an app, a website where he's basically taught verse by verse through the entire Bible and topically as well. Um, a great, um, great teacher. I can't recommend him high enough. If you haven't heard of him, go check him out. Uh, Steve, welcome to Expedition 44. We're excited to have you on. Anything else about yourself you'd like to uh, tell our audience? Uh, not much. That that about covers it. I appreciate that. Uh, I think we have a common, uh, we, we have not met each other, but we have a common friend in Braxton Hunter and, and at Trinity a Theological mm -hmm. Seminary, and that's probably how how we connected, but uh, I'm I I didn't actually go to school there um, or anywhere. I I don't have a, uh, a formal education, but I've been teaching the Bible for, uh, and I ran a Bible school for 16 years. But I've been teaching the Bible for 53 years now, and uh, it's all I do. And so, yeah, you know, you learn a few things in that time. And uh, and we wanted to talk about Israel today. I I just want to say that I began as a dispensationalist with certain understanding of the nation of Israel and of the role of Israel. And uh, it was through my own study of scripture, frankly, I, I had never actually heard anyone who questioned that view at the time that I left it. Uh, I, my own studies caused me to, to, to change. So when we talk about that subject today, I'm speaking as an ex-dispensationalist on it. And Steve, you're in good company here that both, both Matt and I would not prescribe to that. In fact, I went to Moody Bible Institute for my undergrad, which, you know, is is kind of the premier dispensational training place in the country. And, mm -hmm. you know, I would tell you after four years of really going there to when I when I went there when I was 18, my my idea was I didn't understand dispensationalism. I, I, I thought that was what the Bible said. And I said, well, well, this is what the Bible teaches. I want to go get get learn about as much of this confusing topic as I can. And I'd have to say at the end of four years, I was exactly opposite. My, my eyes had been opened and what I had gone there to learn, I actually walked away going like, all right, that's, that's not the way. Yeah, I can understand that. A lot of people tell me they, that their upbringing in dispensationalism left them very confused about things. Um, and it's the I, same way. Yeah. I don't know if I, I don't know if I was, I don't know if I felt like I was confused at the time. I certainly was mistaken, but I didn't know I was mistaken. I didn't know there were other views. Uh, the teacher that I sat under was Chuck Smith at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, mm -hmm. in the early 70s in the Jesus movement. And uh, he certainly was very clear and, and organized in his thinking. And it, it was pretty easy to follow the dispensational program as he taught it. But And I accepted and repeated it as if it were, frankly, the only thing the Bible Right. Yeah. I yeah. think we've all been sort of raised as dispensationalists, whether you realize it or not. So I guess yeah. before we get too far, we're talking about Israel and how how a Jesus follower might view what's going on in modern Israel. But you you know, in order to talk about that, you really have to discuss dispensationalism first, because I think most people, when they feel like they should be supporting Israel or flying the Israel flag, it's heavily influenced by dispensationalism. So that's probably a good place to start. Can you give us a little bit of an idea of what dispensationalism is? And then perhaps this might be a long answer, but then perhaps, you know, kind of transition into why this matters when talking about modern day Israel. Well, dispensationalism is a theological system that did something that previous theological systems, I, I think, had never done. 
in, in the 1830s, a man named John Nelson Darby, uh, who is a very brilliant uh, man, Anglican man, who also was involved in the Plymouth Brethren movement in England. Um, he, he came up with a, a, a detailed system for understanding everything in the scripture. And basically the core of his system was that God's real plan is about the nation of Israel. Uh, there's also the church, but the church is kind of a parenthesis in that plan. God started Israel with uh, Abraham, then developed the, you know, through the Exodus, and the, there was the establishment of the nation, and then the promises he made to David of an eternal kingdom. Uh, then there was the Babylonian exile and the return from the exile, and then Jesus came. Now, in their view, Jesus came primarily and maybe even exclusively at, initially for Israel. Uh, but they and to establish his kingdom with them, but they rejected that, and therefore the kingdom uh program was put on the back burner, uh, it was uh, postponed, is the way they say it. And uh, and the kingdom basically did not come into being, even though Jesus intended for it to, because of the Jews' non cooperation. Therefore, it's postponed until the end of the world when Jesus will come back and establish his kingdom in Israel. Uh, in, during the, a future millennium, a thousand-year reign that they think will occur before the new creation comes. Uh, so that's the dispensational system, and it, and it places uh, Israel, especially ethnic and national Israel, uh, as uh, uniquely significant uh, in the world. And of course, when we talk about modern Israel, we're talking about the fact that since 1948, there's been a new uh, political entity in the same land where ancient Israel was, and it calls itself by the same name, the name Israel. So we have a modern nation of Israel. It doesn't bear any of the characteristics defining it uh, that, that ancient Israel did, with the exception that it's on the same piece of property. And to them, that's very important. They think the property is extremely important. And that uh, many of the people in it, the majority of the people in it, happen to have some Jewish ancestry. Uh, but it's not a restoration of the nation that was in the Old Testament. The, the Bible knows nothing of any Israel that is not a covenant people. Uh, Israel came to be a nation because God made a covenant with them at Mount Sinai. And he said, if you keep this covenant and obey my voice, then you'll be a holy nation and a kingdom of priests to me. And uh, they didn't. Uh, God kept giving them more chances. I mean, they worshiped golden calves. They worshiped Baal. They worshiped Moloch. He sent them into captivity, brought them back. They didn't worship idols anymore, but they still uh, were half-hearted toward God, and uh, then when the Messiah came, most of them did not uh, receive him. He established his kingdom anyway with those who were the remnant of Israel. There always was a remnant of faithful Israel, but the nation and ethnic group as a whole largely failed to meet the conditions for being the covenant people, and therefore Jesus predicted and history demonstrated that within that generation uh, they would come to an end, which they did. In AD 70, the Romans came, destroyed the nation of Israel, destroyed the temple and, and Jerusalem. Uh, the temple's never been rebuilt since. It's been almost 2,000 years now. And, um, and and so Israel came to an end as a, as a national entity, as a covenant people. Now, of course, we have something in Israel today in the land that, that looks kind of like the nation of Israel in the past, except it has no covenant with God. It does not exist because of any covenants. It's just like a secular nation. In fact, it is a secular nation because most of the people in the nation of Israel are not believers in God at all. Uh, or if they believe in God, they don't believe in God according to the Jewish or certainly the Christian manner. Yeah. So, Steve, um, we hear a lot of people talk about conditional and unconditional covenants in the Bible. And I would, I, I have a hard time with that language because I believe that there's an element of covenant that is always a little conditional in the Bible. It's circular, um, reciprocal actions of replying to the gift of grace that's been given to you, so to speak. And so, so I want to do that, but I, but I think it's important to say that like God did fulfill a lot of the covenants that he said, but could you just touch on that? Because I think that's some place that some, some people get hung up on. Yeah, well, there's before the time of Christ, there were three very important covenants related to Israel. One is, the, of course, the initial covenant God made with Abraham. Uh, he promised Abraham that through his seed, uh, all the nations be blessed, 
that God would make Abraham a great nation and would uh, and many nations, the father of many nations, and that he would give to Abram's offspring the land of the Canaanites, which we now call Israel. Um, now, God fulfilled, frankly, all these promises. He did make Abram a great nation. He made him many nations, the Edomites, the Midianites, uh, Israelites, Ishmaelites, they all they all came from Abram. So he certainly did become the father of many nations in that respect. Now, Paul in Galatians 3 uses that expression that God would make him the father of many nations to indicate that Abram has become the father of all people, of all nations, who have embraced Christ. Uh, because through Christ, who is Abraham's seed, those who are in him are now Abraham's seed. Paul made that very clear in Galatians chapter 3. Uh, verses 16 and uh, 29. So so he's our father too now. Um, Paul says in Galatians 3, uh, all who are of faith are the children of Abraham, because Abraham was a man of faith, and being a child of Abraham in any sense that matters to God is to be imitators of his faith. Jesus said the same thing to the Jews. He said in John chapter 8, he said, I know you are Abraham's offspring, but if you were Abraham's children, you would do the deeds of Abraham. You know, you'd be like him. Uh, it doesn't matter whether he's an ancestor of yours going back in your DNA. Uh, what matters is, do you resemble him in his spiritual uh, relationship to God? If not, he said, you're of your father, the devil, and the works of your father you want to do, he said in John 8, 44. So Paul and Jesus made it very clear that the only sense in which it's important to be descended from Abraham is uh, if you have Abraham's spiritual uh, faith and, and affinity toward God. In fact, John the Baptist, even before either Jesus or Paul spoke about this, John the Baptist said to the Jews, don't, don't boast in the fact that you're descended from Abraham. God could raise up from these stones children of Abraham. In other words, there's no value in simply being descended from Abraham. The stones, mm -hmm. you know, they're as good as, they could be as good as you if, if God wished to make them children of Abraham. So uh, this Abrahamic covenant was fulfilled to Abram and his seed. God did give them the land. In the book of Joshua, it tells us that uh, he did. Now, by the way, dispensationalists will say that God never gave them all the land, but Joshua says that God did. It specifically says that God gave them all the land that he promised them, and nowhere in the Bible does it say he didn't. So if we're going to make a choice between two options, either God did give them all the land or he did not, I'll go with the statement that the Bible makes. It says he did, and uh, not with the statement that the Bible never makes, that he didn't. So God did fulfill his promises to Abraham, but there was more to it than that, as Paul brings out, because Christ is the true seed of Abraham through which the ultimate promises will be made. But that's the Abrahamic covenant is the first thing. Now, the children of Abraham eventually became 12 uh, families of, of uh, the sons of 12 men descended from a man named, uh, named Israel. They were called the children of Israel. His name was Jacob, then Israel. Uh, the 12 sons of Israel became the 12 tribes of Israel. And then after they had come out of Egypt, God brought them with a mixed multitude, which means there are a lot of Gentiles with them too, uh, who came to Mount Sinai. And God took that group, the Jews and the Gentiles, or they weren't called Jews yet, the Israelites and the Gentiles. And at Mount Sinai, he made a conditional covenant with them. If you keep my covenant, if you obey my voice, this is in Exodus 19, 5 and 6, you'll be a you'll be a a, a holy people to me. You'll be a kingdom, a priest to me. You'll be a holy nation. Uh, now, of course, they didn't keep the covenant, though God was very forgiving and forbearing, and, and he did give them many, many chances. 1,400 years he gave them chances. Uh, but they eventually were so disobedient, they murdered the Messiah, and, uh, and Jesus spoke as if that was, in fact, the last straw for them. But uh, so, so the nation of Israel, about 1,400 years before Christ, was consisting largely of the descendants of Abraham, but not all. There were Gentiles too, and all who were in the covenant were in the nation of Israel. So Israel was a term that referred to a multi-ethnic nation that was defined not by ethnicity, but by covenant faithfulness. There was never an Israel in the Bible that did not require covenant faithfulness for its definition, which is why the nation that's called Israel today has no relationship to it. I mean, it, it may be ethnic, but that's of no value. John the Baptist made it very clear. It doesn't matter whether you're descended from Abraham. Uh, what matters is if you are in the covenant, and the modern nation of Israel doesn't even pretend to be. The modern nation of Israel is emphatically secular. It's a secular, plural, pluralistic, democratic 
uh, ally of the United States, formed by a secular tribunal called the United Nations, uh, not by a decree of God that we can find anywhere in Scripture or elsewhere. Um, it's it, its founding is a secular founding of a secular nation, and it, and yeah. as a secular nation that doesn't even acknowledge God, it hardly has any connection with the nation that was defined by its covenant with God. So we have simply a, a, a secular nation that calls itself by the name of a ancient nation that was in covenant with God. Now, there was also a covenant made with David. Uh, God, when David was king, uh, God promised him that his descendants would reign forever in his kingdom and that he, would especially a particular son of his, would uh, have an eternal kingdom that God would raise up. And uh, the Jews recognized this as a promise of the Messiah. Christians recognize that Messiah as Jesus. So that brings us to biblical history. Now, because of the rejection of Jesus, Israel was uh, rejected. And it's funny because dispensationalists say the rejection of uh, Jesus by most of the Jews caused the kingdom to be rejected. Uh, the kingdom was not rejected. The nation of Israel, at least those who did not receive the Messiah, were rejected. But those who did receive the Messiah were not. God has never rejected all of his people. The people that he regards as his are the faithful. And when Jesus came, the Israelites who were faithful to God became what we call disciples of Jesus. And mm -hmm. after Pentecost, they became what we call the church. Of course, Israel was called the church in the Old Testament, too. The Greek word ekklesia, which is adopted in the New Testament, to, which means the church. That word was used in the Greek Old Testament to refer to Israel, the congregation of Israel. So really, there's no distinction. In the Old Testament, Israel was a the church, the ecclesia, which was a multi-ethnic people defined by faithfulness to God's covenant. In the New Covenant, which Jesus made in the upper room with his disciples, Israel is likewise a multi-ethnic entity defined by faithfulness to God in his covenant. So, I mean, and the people who entered that New Covenant were initially people who were part of the Old Covenant. So when pe some people say, well, you're saying the church replaced Israel. No, I'm not saying the church replaced Israel. I'm saying Israel was the church in the Old Testament and still is. It's just that what we say Israel, Paul said, not all who are of Israel are Israel. That is not, not all people who have Jewish ancestry belong to Israel, only the ones who are faithful. We also call them the church today, as they were called in the Old Testament. The faithful remnant are the ones. So what do we think about the nation of Israel today? Well, there's two aspects of the answer to that question. One is, what did the Bible predict, and is what's happening today in any sense a fulfillment of a biblical prediction? The other is, what actually has happened there and is happening there today? And many times both of these questions are obscured by particularly dispensational teaching, and people who even don't regard themselves as dispensationalists often simply picked up by osmosis from Christian media and other places a dispensational concept here. Again, is this a fulfillment of prophecy? And really, what did happen? Well, those who say it is a fulfillment of prophecy usually are referring to passages like Ezekiel 36 and 37, or Jeremiah chapters 31 through 34, um, or certain other passages in, uh, in Scripture in the Old Testament that speak of God bringing his people back to their land and reestablishing their nation again. Now, of course, after 2,000 years uh, dispersed, when the Jews were dispersed in AD 70 into all the world, in modern times, a lot of Jews have come back to their ancestral homeland. Uh, but is this what God predicted? Well, first of all, we should note that there are two exiles predicted in the, in the Bible, and only one return. The first exile is the Babylonian exile. The prophets predicted that. And the second exile, Jesus and John the Baptist predicted, which was in AD 70. In between those times, there was a restoration. God first exiled the people to Babylon in 586 BC. And then in 539 BC, through Cyrus's decree, under the leadership of Zerubbabel, eventually Ezra and Nehemiah were involved also, God brought back the faithful remnant to Israel from Babylon. Now, now, that return was predicted. All of the predictions in the Bible about God bringing his people back 
were uttered before he brought them back. That is, they were pre-exilic or exilic prophets, meaning the prophets were talking before the exile actually occurred or during it, like Ezekiel. Um, uh, Zechariah, who's post-exilic, has one reference to it, but he was still living in the midst of the time when this was happening. Ezra and Nehemiah had not come back, but they're bringing their groups with them yet. So in truth, all the passages that speak of God bringing his people back from exile are fulfilled when he brought them back from the Babylonian exile. So, yeah. After that happened, just there to be, just to no be more clear, I want to really emphasize this, just to be clear, any passages that would that would prophetically say God is going to regather his people, that that he's going to, you know, there's an exile and God's regathering him. It's already happened. It's our, it's already taken place. We're not looking for anything else there. And and you and I would both say that the, there's nothing anywhere in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, that would say we're waiting for anything else to happen here. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I mean, God can do whatever he wants to that he hasn't told yeah. us. Right. God hasn't told us whether, you know, something else will happen. But but in terms of prophetic promises and predictions that, that must be fulfilled, there are none that have not been fulfilled with reference to the return of exiles uh, from Babylon. And, and, and after the Babylonian exile, there were no more promises of that sort ever made. There was, of course, in John the Baptist and Jesus preaching, the threat of another exile in AD 70, which did occur. But right. there's nowhere in the Bible that ever speaks of a second restoration from that. So then the elephant in the room is, what about Israel made into a new nation? Like the Bible doesn't say that, but it happened. And you get into, no. is this double fulfillment? Is it just coincidence? Like, wh what do you do with that? Well, I don't think it's coincidence. and I don't think it's double fulfillment. Um, we have to understand that people can do things whether God approves of it or not. Mm -hmm. Now, some people think that, I, I've heard one um, Jewish Christian say repeatedly, if God scattered them, man could not unscatter them. You know, yeah. other, only God can regather them. Well, where does Sometimes it say I call that people trying to play God, engineering, yeah. Exactly, and and I and I think, well, where does it say that actually, that, that people cannot regather them? There are, some Jews are regathered to Israel. Uh, approximately half of the worldwide population of Jews are now back in Israel, about 7 million, um, which is a, a, around about half the, the world population. I think a little more are still not gathered, still in the di diaspora, but it doesn't matter what the percentages are. The question is, even if all the Jews would come back to Israel, which I don't anticipate happening, but if they did, that what what prophecy is that supposed to be fulfilling? You see, all the prophecies that talk about returning exiles, as I said, they were these prophecies were fulfilled in 539 BC when the Jews, the remnant, did come back. Mm -hmm. um, but all those prophecies speak about them coming back because they are believers. Uh, now, dispensationalists used to say that too. Dispensationalists used to say in the old days that Israelites all over the world are going to become believers in Christ, and then God will bring them back and restore their land. However, yeah, J. Vernon McGee, right? He was J. Vernon McGee said that. that. Yeah. Yep. I mean, he was one of the, the ones who was still saying it in his lifetime, but in the in this mm -hmm. in the 19th century, when dispensationalism was growing, that was the common view that Israel would become mm -hmm. believers in exile and then God would bring them back to their Get land. Back. Get that. McGee was an old school dispensationalist unlike many today. But see, when Israel became a political entity in 1948, many dispensationalists thought, oh, well, this is the fulfillment of the prophecy. But wait, the Jews have not become believers. But they said, well, probably the Bible really said that they're going to come back in unbelief. Let's find that. And so they find some passages that talk about the restoration where it doesn't mention whether or not they're believers. In. It just mentions God bringing them back. They say, see, they were brought back in unbelief. But what they miss out on is that more passages that talk about the return of the Exodus point out that God does it because they return to God. Uh, for those who would like to see the earliest reference to that, there are more throughout the prophets. But in Deuteronomy chapter 30, let me turn there. 
here's what God says in, in Deuteronomy 29, God predicts the exile into Babylon. And, uh, and of course, dispensationalists would say, well, that also applies to the exile in AD 70, but it, there's no reason to believe that. And in chapter 30, after this exile, it says in verses 1, Deuteronomy 30, verse 1 and through 3, now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessings and the curse, which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity. And it goes on, he talks about how he'll restore them, and he says in verse 10, um, uh, verse 9 and 10, he says, for the Lord will again rejoice over you for good, as he rejoiced over your fathers, if you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments, and if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Now, Moses said that if they're disobedient, they'll go into exile. But when they turn to God again, God will bring them back. They'll turn to God with all their heart and all their, or their soul. They'll become obedient. Now, that did happen. That is, the, the, the remnant that returned from Babylon, in fact, were, according to Ezra 1.5, those whose spirits the Lord had touched and moved. They were people who were repentant. They were people who came back to build the temple. So th these prophecies were in fact fulfilled, but you'll never find any prophecy that says they will come back in unbelief. The, the one that uh, that dispensations use most often is Ezekiel 36, where God, and 37 especially, where both of those prophecies, they talk about God restoring them to their land and then pouring his spirit upon them and, and washing them with clean water. And, of course, chapter 37 of Ezekiel uses the dry bones vision to make this point that God gathers the dry bones together and assembles them into dead bodies, uh, no life in them yet. And then, secondarily, he pours his spirit out on them, and they become alive. Now, this speaks of the two stages of restoration of Israel from Babylon. One is the physical restoration, which happened in the days of Zerubbabel, when they were regathered as a nation. The, the, the bones were reassembled into structures. Um, but the outpouring of the Spirit and the washing with clean water doesn't occur until Pentecost, about 500 years later. Right. So there's two aspects of God's restoration, he promises. One is their physical restoration. This is not of unbelievers. This is believers. But even though they're believers in the Old Testament, they didn't receive the Spirit and the washing that came through Christ. In Zechariah chapter 13, 1, it says that God's going to open a fountain of cleansing for the house of Israel and the house of Judah. That fountain, I believe, was the fountain of Christ's blood. And it goes on to say in another place in Zechariah 12, 1, that, or 12, 10, he'll pour out his spirit upon them, which he did at Pentecost. Um, and so there's no part of this prophecy that remains uh, unfulfilled, and, it, and the part that talks about them coming back before he's poured his spirit doesn't say they're unbelievers that time. Mm -hmm. Lots of people in the Old Testament were believers, right. but didn't have the spirit poured out on them. That's that's talking about the new covenant coming. So uh, it's simply a, a failure to be careful in, in yeah. interpreting those passages that makes people think they are fulfilled. There's new, no New Testament passage predicting right. the return of Jews to, to their land. So I think the hard part of this for dispensationalists and I'm always trying to think unbiasedly. What what does the what would the other side say about this? And this is difficult for me because I think I line up with your thoughts exactly on this. Like, uh, but but I want to I want to try to just say if there's a dispensationalist watching this, what what are they thinking right now? And this gets into a lot of different views of Revelation. And again, I think you and I line up with our views. So this where I'm going doesn't make sense from my context of understanding the book of Revelation, but where you kind of get with the dispensationalist is that, yes, Israel right now is not going to be a believing nation, but then the rapture, the great disappearing act is going to take place. And then that might cause them to rethink their thinking. Perhaps there's 144,000 missionaries that change their mind and then they kind of come together and, you know, out of remorse, all of a sudden are reaccepted, and then God partners with them to sort of, you know, set up this re, you know, reestablish like a Levitical priesthood, bring in sacrifices, build a new temple, all of this stuff, and they're going to partner with God in in the 
seven, seven and a half years to change the course of the world to, you know, possibly come to Jesus at that point. How, how do you even start? I mean, I, I don't, I've got a THD and I've been doing this for a long time. How do you even start that? I mean, it seems like that's such a, there's such a large framework of misunderstanding to be rectified before you can come to a better view that I, I haven't figured out. Maybe you have what, what, what's your take on that? Well, there's again, two, two parts of that. When we talk about the book of revelation, one of them is what is revelation talking about? Uh, and the other is, is there any reference in there to any of these things that you listed? Right. Um, uh, the first thing is what does, you know, what is the time frame of Revelation's fulfillment? Well, the author says repeatedly that these things are going to shortly take place. The time is at hand. Uh, the angel actually tells him, don't seal up the words of the book of this prophecy because the time is at hand, which is the opposite of what the angel told Daniel. Daniel was told to seal up the book of his prophecy because it wasn't going to be immediately fulfilled. Yeah. It'll be concealed later on. Now, John is told that his prophecies, and this was told to him in the first century AD, uh, that his prophecies are going to be soon fulfilled and don't seal them up because it's not, there's no great interval. So uh, there's really nothing in the book of Revelation that actually says this is a prophecy about the end times. Many have assumed it is right. because they take a rather strange literal approach to the book and they figure, well, if this is literal, this never happened, you know. <laughs> And they're right. If it's literal, it never did. But why would anyone who knows anything about the Bible think that the book of Revelation is supposed to be taken literally? No one takes right. it literally. Right. Even, even the dispensations don't. I mean, Jesus 27 times in Revelation is called a lamb who has seven eyes and seven horns. I don't know anyone who believes Jesus is literally a lamb that has seven eyes and seven horns. The, the ruler of the world, the evil ruler is an animal with you know seven heads right. and ten horns. Yeah. Does anyone believe in a literal animal like that? I don't. Right. But there's nobody who believes in a literal approach to Revelation. Dispensationists just want to take as much of it as possible as literal. But is that really the way you take apocalyptic literature when you find that it's written almost entirely in symbols? Are you supposed to look for as many things as possible to take literally, or are you supposed to seek to understand the genre and make sense of the symbols? Anyway, because people sometimes mistakenly feel they're somehow obliged to take much of Revelation literally, they have to say, well, if we do, that's not that's not, not happened in the past, so it must be future. Well, okay, well, they're starting with the wrong assumption about the genre, but, right. uh, but I'll just say this, there's nothing in Revelation that says, in the end times, this is going to happen, or at the end of the world, or, you know, in the last days, those terms are not found in Revelation. It's just a bunch of visions of what John saw. Therefore, the assumption that it's about the end times is an assumption that the reader brings to the passage if he doesn't understand very much about apocalyptic literature or even doesn't pay attention to this fact that the book says it's going to be shortly fulfilled, shortly after mm -hmm. it was revealed. Uh, so, you know, I won't go into all the reasons for my taking different view, except that it's, I, it's about four more videos on top of this one, but yeah. yeah. Or, or just but, buy or just buy this. Yeah, my book, four views. <laughs> right. And read the read the preterist column. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's that. There's that. You know, there's nothing in the Bible that suggests the Book of Revelation is about the end times. But let's let's just go with it that it is. I mean, most people assume it is. So, where in the Book of Revelation do you find a reference to Israel coming back uh, from their exile? There's no mention of that there. Where do you find a seven-year tribulation? Not in the Bible. Not in Revelation. There's no mention of seven years, despite the fact that there's seven of everything else. Revelation's got seven of everything except seven years. Uh, now, what it does have is uh, five different references to a period of three and a half years. So if you want to, you can artificially, you know, tag those to each other and make two periods of three and a half years, but there's no exegetical reason to do that unless you've decided previously that you want seven years. Right. Uh, Daniel never said it's going to be 483 years and there's going to be this grand gap on the last seven. Like when you have insinuated that if that was the plan or something yeah it would have been helpful yeah i mean the only the only basis for believing in a seven-year tribulation is the presumption that daniel's 70th week is the great is the tribulation and that it has been postponed once again there's no scholars who believe that the first 69 weeks of daniel 9 have been postponed all, all believe those have been fulfilled but the dispensationist believes that after the 69th week, there was a gap of almost 2,000 years, 
and the 70th week hasn't yet begun. And when it does, it's seven years tribulation. And then they try to apply that to the book of Revelation. So, uh, but the truth is, uh, there's no biblical basis in Daniel to say that there's been a postponement of the 70th week. So yep. it's, uh, you know, people make different assumptions about prophecies. All I would say is, if you're actually making no assumptions and just reading the book, you'll find no reference to seven years right. in Revelation. You'll find no reference to a, a man, Antichrist, you find a beast, two beasts actually, actually mm -hmm. quite a few beasts, but but one beast that comes out of the sea is often identified as the Antichrist, as if that's a man. But the in the beasts in Revelation are conglomerates of beasts from Daniel. Daniel saw four beasts: a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a ten-horned beast in Daniel seven, and they're all put together in one beast in Revelation thirteen. It's a beast like a leopard. It's got feet like a bear, a mouth like a lion. It's got seven heads and ten horns. So you've got Daniel's four beasts mixed up into one beast. But Daniel's beasts were not individuals. Daniel's beasts were empires. Kingdoms. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you've got separate empires. Why, why would the beast of Revelation suddenly become an individual man? I mean, it, it never describes him as a man. It describes him as an animal. But that's exactly the way the empires are described in Daniel. So you know, this whole idea that there's a man, Antichrist, in the middle of the tribulation, sets up an image of himself in the temple in Jerusalem. There's no mention of anyone setting up an image of anything in a temple in Jerusalem. There is a temple mentioned in Revelation 11, 1 and 2, but there's no reason to believe that it's a future temple. It doesn't say it is. It, it's a, a temple that's about to be destroyed, and its outer courts will be given to the Gentiles to trample it down until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. That probably is a reference to the temple that was standing in the first century. Uh, so, and Greg, you're going to like this story. I grew up in a very traditional biblical household. My dad was a circuit riding preacher. It makes me sound like I'm from the 1800s, but within a denominational, they still did that. And and I grew up in the late great planet Earth, Hal Lindsey, then later piercing the darkness. So everything was dispensationalism, which, which again led me want to go to Bible college to understand all this crazy stuff. But my my parents would tell you the story of, you know, they they had this church meeting and, you know, gathering, circling, small group of this great minister coming to, to, to give clarity the book of Revelations. And I'm in junior high at the time. And I sit there and listen to this three hour thing. And at the end, like, I'm the only kid in there. And the guy looks at me and goes, so what do you think of all this? And I, and I look at him square in the eye and go, you got to have an awfully big imagination to get that out of what we just read. And everybody yeah. laughed. And, you know, now years later, I look back at that and think, wow, you know, that was from, from the mouth of a child, you know? Well, how many, how many volumes of the left behind series of novels were written? 14, 12, they're like big, that, yeah. big novels. Like that, yeah. And yet they purport to be telling the story that's found in the book of revelation, which probably has about 20 pages. And, uh, you know, a little bit of Zechariah, a little bit of Ezekiel, right. a little bit of Daniel, uh, you know, so all together, maybe 40 pages, if that, of the Bible, uh, and they make 14 volumes or 12 volumes, thick volumes of it. It's, they do, they do use their imagination a great deal. And and frankly, the sad thing is the little bit in those stories that has some connection to pages in the Bible actually is reading into those prophecies and Bible things that they don't say. So this whole dispensational scheme is is very confusing to people who don't mm -hmm. know the bible very well and who just yeah, and you talked earlier sorry you talked earlier about how it's uh such a new system like under 200 years old and uh john nelson darby and that and out of that um has come like this view of zionism um you've talked about that in some of your lectures i've can you give us just kind of maybe a little bit of breakdown of how that connects to dispensationalism and kind of how zionism came about because that's really kind of at the root of the way the modern church in america views israel is like the zionist view right uh well you know many people think the nation of israel exists today because of uh bible prophecy but more likely it exists because of zionism now zionism is uh actually began as a secular movement a man named theodore herzl in uh, europe uh had a, a conference in Basel, Switzerland in, in uh, 1897, which was the first Zionist conference. Now, he was not a believing Jew. He was a Jew, but he was a secular Jew. 
Uh, it is, it is, uh, he never, never practiced Judaism or, or believed in the Jewish God, but he started this movement called Zionism, which was to uh, give the, the Jews around the world uh, a homeland uh, where they could be frankly safe because they had been persecuted in Russia and in the, and in the Holocaust and World War II and things like that. Uh, the Jews have been really insecure among the nations because they've been persecuted by anti-Semites and things like that. And so many Jews thought it'd be better if they had their own land so that, you know, the government wouldn't pers persecute them because they would be it. And uh, actually, it wasn't initially assumed that they'd have to be going back to Palestine, which is what it was, Israel was called back then. Uh, they actually considered Cyprus as a place and Argentina as a place and Uganda as an option. These are, these are different places that the early Zionists considered, but eventually they thought, well, why not just Palestine? Why not go back to the original homeland? And that movement grew quite a bit. Um, by the the uh, early uh, 20th century, there were like 20,000 Zionists in America. It was a European movement, but it took off more in America. And, and it really took off because of dispensationalism. Even though the Zionist movement was started as a secular movement, having no reference to God or Jewish religion, by Jewish people who were secular, uh, it really got a religious impetus through the through Darby and through uh, and through a guy named William Blackstone, a, a minister who had a tremendous influence on American Christianity's thinking, and put tremendous pressure over the years on many American presidents to support the idea of a Jewish state uh, in Palestine, and um, it was of course Harry Truman who eventually uh, urged the United Nations, more or less um, pressured the United Nations to declare uh, a new state of Israel in 1948. Uh, so this was done by dispensational influence to a very large degree. And, and I, that's not just me saying that as a as a disgruntled uh, former dispensationalist. Uh, that's, that's me saying that because I got it from reading histories of the modern state of Israel, many of them written by unbelieving Jews themselves. They, they credit dispensationalism and American evangelicalism for founding the modern state of Israel for the most part, or for at least playing a major role in it. See, some people think, well, you know, it must be God's doing because it's a miracle. And, and we dispensationalists were predicting this before it even happened. And look, it happened just the way we said. So dispensationalism is true. Well, maybe uh, I could also say to somebody, uh, your dog is going to die today, then pull out my gun and shoot your dog. Uh, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It doesn't mean I was inspired. Uh, you know, you can you can make something happen if you're if you've got influence, and certainly mm -hmm. dispensationalists having uh, outsized influence in evangelicalism in or uh, in early 20th century America. So, and and there's no question, even secular historians will say, yeah, it's the dispensational influence that, for the most part, um, uh, you know, pushed the American presidency to push the United Nations to become. Uh, supporters of the state of Israel. Um, it's interesting that I mentioned William Blackstone, who was a dispensationalist who really pushed for this. Uh, he is sometimes thought, even by secular Zionists, to be the true father of Zionism. Uh, there was a, a, a Zionist leader, actually the, the leader of Zionism in America was Brandeis, the, the Supreme Court Justice, uh, in the time of uh, Truman, I guess it was. And um, Brandeis actually said that he thought that William Blackstone, more than Theodore Herzl, was the father of Zionism. Now, Blackstone was a dispensational writer. like a, He was like a Hal Lindsey of his day. His uh, his books were translated into many languages. They were distributed. They, were, they sold by the millions. They were sent to all the ministers, uh, you know, and things like that. So, so uh Many people have never heard of Blackstone, but he was like the Hal Lindsey, late great planet Earth, or the Tim LaHaye, uh, you know, Left Behind series of the day. Except he didn't write novels; he wrote, he just wrote books about dispensational interpretations of prophecy and pushed for Zionism. So, so the movement began as a secular movement. It was uh, it was really propelled by Christians before before religious Jews really got on the bandwagon for it. But because of the growth of it, and especially because of the uh, horror that the world felt after the Holocaust and realized the plight that the Jews were in, there was a strong push to allow 
the Zionists to reestablish the nation of Israel. Now, the Zionists, again, were largely not Christians, but they were, they or, or religious Jews, but they were, uh, you know, helped along a great deal, if not totally propelled by dispensationalist Christians who wanted to make prophecy come true. And yet they couldn't make prophecy come true because it hasn't. When people say, it's a miracle, you know, the Jews have come back. Uh, yeah, but they didn't come back the way the Bible says they would. Of course, they did come back that way in 539 BC, which is what was predicted. But there's no prediction of them coming back in the end times. And if we want to use any of the predictions of the Old Testament, because there's none in the New, to say that what's happening in Israel today is a fulfillment of prophecy, we have to just say, well, it's a double fulfillment. We know it was fulfilled in 539 BC, but but we'll just say it's happening again as a double fulfillment. Well, that unfortunately doesn't work. We might be uh, might be at liberty to say some things, some prophecies do have double fulfillments, but uh, but they'd have to be the same kind of fulfillment. The, yeah. the prophecy the prophecy said God would bring people, the Jews, back to Him, and then He'd gather them to their land. <clears throat> as a result of that. That has not happened. Do you know, 0.5%, less than, you know, half of 1% of the Jews in Israel are Christians. That means 99.5% of the Jews in Israel are anti-Christian. Mm -hmm. They don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. John said in 1 John chapter 2, whoever denies that Jesus is the Messiah is antichrist. So, I mean, it's not you don't have to be Jewish to be Antichrist. Anyone who denies that Jesus is the Messiah is Antichrist. That includes 99.5% of the Jews in Israel. They're Antichrist. Now, how many of them are religious Jews? Uh, less than 19% are religious Jews. 20% or more are atheists. So, I mean, there's actually a larger representation of atheist Jews in Israel than there are of even observant Jews. Hmm. And even if they were all observant Jews, that's not... That's not faithful to God. God's being faithful to God means being faithful to Jesus, his Messiah. So you really don't have anything resembling what God described in the prophets there. You have a secular nation that was pushed by certain agendas and uh, and exists for the time being now. Now, I say for the time being because we don't know if it's going to last. I'll tell you, I I hope it does. Not because I'm against the Palestinians. I'm actually as sympathetic toward the Palestinians as I am toward the Israelis. But there were many injustices done to the Palestinians in the founding of Israel and, and since then. But most of the injustices were done 75 to 80 years ago. The people living in Israel now, both Palestinian and Israel, most of them had nothing to do with it. Most of them were born there or, or moved there since that time. You know, I, I have to say the founding of Israel was fraught with injustices on both sides. There are terrorists mm -hmm. on the Jewish side. There was a Jewish terrorist organization in 1947 before Israel became a nation and afterwards. Uh, Menachem Begin was the head of that organization. It's called Irgun. And they they did terrorist acts against the British, uh, hanging British soldiers who were, in, uh, who were kind of overseeing the thing, blowing up the King David Hotel. I think it killed 90 different innocent people in the hotel. Uh, they they raided a, a Palestinian village called Dir Yasun uh, or Yasin, uh, which uh, where they they just lined up against the wall and shot men, women, and children after raping the women. These were the Israeli terrorists doing this. Now there were Jewish, I mean, there were Palestinian terrorists also, and they were doing the same kinds of things. This is all around the time before and just after Israel was founded as a nation in forty seven and forty eight, and. So, it, you know, we, we get a very whitewashed picture of the founding of Israel as if it's a clean, godly mm -hmm. thing that God did. No, it, it, it was done through force and terrorism and, and uh, yeah. you know, uh, innocent blood being shed. I mean, this is, this is the kind of stuff Christians can't very much approve of. And many Jews right. didn't either, by the way. Many European Jews were absolutely against Zionism because it involved taking from the Palestinians— the land that they had lived in for 1,300 years. The Palestinians, the Arabs there in Palestine, they had ancestors had lived there and farmed that land for uh, uh, 1,300 years. And then some foreign body, the United Nations, tells them, sorry, we're giving your property to these people here. They're going to come in and take it. And, uh, 
and you've got nothing to say about it. Well, there were Palestinians who said, well, we are going to have something to say about it. We're going right. to do bad things, or drive the Israelis out. Israelis were doing the same thing. Both sides were behaving pretty much the same way. Um, yep. And the question of, well, whose side would I be on if I was around them? Well, I was born uh, only about five years after that. So I wasn't around, didn't know anything about it. But as a Christian, I'd have to say, I'm not sure that this Zionist project is really reflective of God's justice. It certainly isn't yeah. reflective of God's prophetic predictions. And, uh, you know, as a Christian, I need to evaluate all nations, all geopolitics from the standpoint of justice. Now, by those standards, how would we assess the modern state of Israel today? And particularly when we say today, of course, you and I are talking right now in the context of an ongoing war that right. began mm -hmm. earlier this month with the Palestinians slaughtering something like 14 hundred yep. Israelis and taking 200 or more into captivity as, as hostages. And then Israel has at this point retaliated and killed millions of, of the Palestinians. And um, that's going on as we speak. And obviously this is very much in the forefront of many people's thinking, you know, how are we to look at this? I would just say, look at it the way you'd look at, you know, at uh, a conflict between any other two secular groups. How do we look at the Ukraine-Russia situation? Well, it's complicated. It's mm -hmm. complicated. Uh, I'm kind of on the side of Ukraine, but I don't have all the information. I'm not saying that the Russians don't have any claim at all. I, I, I'm not an expert on, on that. Neither am I or any of us really experts on the Middle East crisis. I think both sides have done evil. Yep. Uh, and both sides have valid complaints against the other. I... Uh, I'll just tell you my own, I, what little I know of the situation that I get from the news. I'm, uh, I, I lean slightly in favor of Israel in this one because uh, the Palestinians struck first. Now, those who are pro-Palestinian say, no, they didn't. Uh, Israel struck, you know, 75 years ago and has been oppressing the Palestinians ever since. We're just trying to get, you know, get back at them and drive them out. So in other words, they would say the Palestinians are native freedom fighters against an oppressive invasion population. Well, that might have been a way of looking at it in 1948. But most people who were alive in 1948 aren't alive anymore. And the ones who are alive over there are essentially innocent of whatever atrocities were done by either side in those days. So, so we have to judge people by their present atrocities. You know, I believe America in its founding, probably we did some atrocities against the American nations. Uh, the Indian nations. Um, yeah. uh, I don't think uh, that they were free from their atrocities. The Indian nations were also bloodthirsty, warring tribes and did horrible uh, things and were pagans and so forth. So we have to say, well, they weren't exactly clean, but we weren't exactly clean either. But but that's old news. None of us were alive then. And what we as Christians need to do is see what we can do to do justly and love mercy and walk humbly before God and and try to uh, you know, treat all people justly. And if some people are oppressed, try to eliminate that oppression, if we can, in some just way. But uh, but I don't think we have to stand, I don't stand with the European Americans who took this country away, even though I'm one of them. Well, I'm not one of them, my ancestors were. Uh, I, think the, I think the Indians are human too, and we need to be concerned about their rights. But I don't think we can turn the clock back. I don't think we can say, okay, let's go back, give the land to the Indians. We'll go back to Europe. Let's let's you replay the tape from the beginning and do it differently. Uh, you, you can't change history. You can try to redress wrongs that continue to exist, but you can't you can't blame existing generations for what their ancestors did. Ezekiel 18 makes very clear a, a son will not be held accountable for his father's sins. Uh, that's not okay. That's not justice to say, uh, you didn't oppress me, but your ancestors oppressed my ancestors, so you owe me. No, I'm sorry. That's not how justice works. I can say this as a Christian, I want to do what I can to remedy whatever's in my power to remedy, but we can't, we can't just turn the tape back and run and start over again well, without those oppressions. So that's part of history. Every nation, every part of the world has uh, had people who conquered other people. Uh, often very nastily, and uh, and yet we 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 just accept the status quo now, which 
is how we found them when we're born. And I think in many cases, there's not much we can do. We can look at the situation and say, well, this injustice is continuing to happen. So let's speak out against that. Okay. So Palestinians are doing injustices. Actually, the Hamas is committing injustice against their own people. It's true mm -hmm. that Israel Israel has uh, apparently killed uh, quite a few. 8,500? 8,500 8, uh, Palestinians. Palestinians. And who were not all, I mean, most of them were non-combatants, but, mm -hmm. uh, but it's complicated. I mean, either Israel doesn't fight the war or they fight it to win. Uh, no sense fighting a war just to drag it out for another 75 years. I, I, we could just say Israel can roll over and say, okay, we're tired of fighting. Why don't we just let the Palestinians drive us into the sea? Uh, or they can say, well, we can fight back. We can defend ourselves. We can try to uh, keep our families and our homes uh, secure, like almost anyone in any nation would do. Uh, and knowing that these people are hiding behind the civilians, uh, we've told those civilians to get out of there if they can. We don't want to kill any civilians, uh, but we've got to go for the nasty guys who are killing our babies. And uh, so, I mean, you can, you've got to see in a way there's both sides of this. I think the Israelis would say, we are very sorry that there are over 8,000 Palestinian civilians killed. We weren't targeting them. We wanted them to be out of harm's way. It's it's Hamas that put them in harm's way by making them human shields. Uh, we we could not avoid taking out the military targets that are aiming to destroy us simply because they nastily and and, and unjustly force civilians to be between them and us. So what, what can we do? It's it's complicated. I don't know the answer. I'm not a I'm not an expert in statecraft at all. I don't I don't profess any, but I would say this. I don't think anyone can glibly say, well, we, we support Israel completely in this, or we support the Palestinians completely in this. I'd say there's a few generations of injustices that are have been smoldering and and uh, you know, some uh, Palestinians think of themselves as freedom fighters. Uh, we maybe think of them as terrorists. Um, but one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist, I suppose. Terrorist. So, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, and one, one thing I've been thinking of really is like, so as believers, as, um, you've written two books here on the kingdom of God and like our identity is followers of the way followers of Jesus. So like, uh, there's a call in the Bible to, to love the brotherhood, but to honor all people, mm -hmm. uh, first Peter chapter two, uh, and there are, I mean, yes, th there are there are messianic Jews in Israel. We should be supporters of them, but there are also a, a significant like what? Uh, do you know the percentage of Christian uh, Palestinian Christians? Is I think like I heard ten it, or less. It's it like it's like seven percent. Seven percent. Yeah, I knew it was somewhere around ten. Actually, seven percent of that. Yeah, when you think of it, among Israelis in Israel. The percentage of Christians is half of one percent. Among mm -hmm. the Palestinians, the percentage who are Christians is seven percent. One percent. Yeah. So who so, are we going to? I mean, I'm not saying that we're part of a separate kingdom, even though it's, these are part of like that's just it. Palestine, that's, part of part of Israel. But we have people on both sides of the border that are part of our kingdom. Exactly. Exactly. As Christians, we do not champion. Uh, one political nation over another, uh, just yeah, we're uh, part of another kingdom. <laughs> we're, we're, we are we are for the we are for people. We are against the kingdom of darkness and all unrighteousness and all injustice. And it doesn't matter who commits it. If our country commits it, we have to stand against. Not so much against our country. We have to critique it. We have to actually. Yeah. You know, we um, we don't seek to overthrow the country. Because that's that not prophetic voice from the margins. Right. Exactly. We need to say this is not acceptable. This has got to stop. And, uh, you know, we have to say that to any nation that is doing unacceptable things. On the other hand, saying those things doesn't mean that we have to take up arms and go and mm -hmm. fight uh, for the side that we prefer. Because actually, uh, our the kingdom of God is not really one of the kingdoms of this world. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would have fought. Mm -hmm. but, but he says, but henceforth, my kingdom is not from here. So his kingdom is not from here. It's here. We are in it here. But it's not a warring kingdom in that sense. The weapons not of our like warfare. this world. Yeah, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. 
uh, we do we do wage war against the powers of darkness, but it's a warfare of truth, of righteousness, of um, even even of our own martyrdom. Uh, you know, to to do what we can to end evil, which is on both sides, and you know, which is the cause of war. So, Steve, this has been a great a great moment with you, and I, you know, I feel like Matt and I and you could probably lock ourselves in a room and talk for weeks just on this subject, and I'd kind of like to do that. But bringing it to a close. Is there anything, any part of this that I that maybe needs to still be spoken or anything you might have missed in here? Any points you'd like to make before we kind of draw it down? Well, I would, uh, you know, I've said probably most of the things I would even say in closing, but I, I would just say that Christians today Ooh. are very interested in knowing what the proper position is to take about Israel. And many of a certain kind of Christians feel like a default support of Israel mm -hmm. is incumbent upon us and is, is necessary because otherwise you're not taking God's side because right. God is on Israel's side. My position is God is on, is on God's side. God is on Christ's side. Israel is not, as a nation, on Christ's side or God's side. Uh, and neither are the Pal Palestinians for the most part. There are some within them, in, within both groups, a considerably a denser portion of the Palestinian group are Christians, uh, usually Orthodox Christians, uh, you know, more than in um, among Israeli Jews. But, but war of this kind, although we can say we hope that through war, God will cause righteousness to prevail, we recognize that this warfare is not something that Christians can take one side or the other, unless you find a war where everyone is strictly victims mm. and, and everyone is, and the other side is strictly aggressors. Uh, it's more complicated than that. I think when people ask me what I think about Israel, uh, I'd have to say, well, which actions of Israel are you talking about? Right. You know? And at uh, what time? Yeah. At what point? Yeah. At what point? Uh, if they say, are you pro-Palestinian? I'd say, well, I'm, I'm pro-humanity. Uh, certainly. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I believe that God loves every one of them, and uh, and he grieves the loss of the wicked, and many of those who die are, in fact, wicked, but uh, he, God even grieves that. He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but right. that the wicked should turn from his evil way and live. As far as nations are concerned, uh, frankly, God's going to sort out how that happens. I pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, and uh, when I see injustice and I'm asked about it, I'll certainly give my opinion against it. Uh, but I'll leave the outcomes to God because, frankly, to think that I can affect the outcomes other than that, without other than by prayer and speaking right. out, uh, is to delude myself into thinking I've got more power than I do. Mm -hmm. And so I also have learned to take responsibility for things that are my responsibility and to leave that which is not my responsibility in the hands of God and pray for his kingdom to come and his will to be done. Mm -hmm. Good words. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Steve, for coming on. We love this conversation with you. We've just loved your wisdom and your insight um, and just how much you've studied this topic in the Bible and just given a, like a complete lens of a biblical perspective on Israel um, biblically and modern and the modern state as well. So just wanted to thank you. Um, for our audience, please go check out the narrowpath.com. Um, follow Steve on social media, uh, follow his teachings, uh, download the app, listen to his stuff. Um, you will grow immensely in your faith, um, in your knowledge of the Bible. Steve, thank you for your dedication to the kingdom. Um, we just love you. And so thanks for thank coming. You guys. On. It's great to meet May you. God bless you and keep you. You too. God bless. Bye now.